Wow. Wow! I don't mean to, I don't mean to wreck his mojo, but let's see if he is trustworthy. About four hours ago and about three different events ago, I gave him the actual compass of George Washington. Dear God, tell me you still have it in your pocket. <laughs> oh, <okay>. See? Hey. <laughs> wow. God bless the great state of Iowa. <laughs> David Barton, Bob Vanderplot, Steve King, Glenn Beck, what an array of strong principal patriots. Men who love this country, men who love the Constitution, men who love God, and men who are willing to stand up and speak the truth, whatever the cost. And I got to say, every time I listen to Glenn Beck speak, I learn something. It's like going to school all over again. Such a firm grounding in the founding principles of our nation. Such an understanding of the dangers of progressivism, the dangers and threats that are assaulting this country, and such an incredible faith and belief in the people of the United States of America. I am so proud to be standing with Glenn, standing with each of these champions for freedom, and standing today with each and every one of you. You know, I do have to say, it's pretty cold outside. <laughs> but, but you know what? It's even colder in Washington, D.C. <laughs> They've got a blizzard, and the government is shut down. Of course, the mainstream media immediately blamed it on me. <laughs> but I was a little confused. I mean, Al Gore told us this wasn't going to happen. But I'll tell you, it was cold in Washington. It was really cold. It was so cold, I saw a Democrat with his hands in his own pockets. Actually, it was Hillary. She was just hiding an email flash drive. <laughs> you know, and I will point out that more than a few commentators have suggested that on both the Democrat and Republican sides of this presidential election, there may be some candidates with Napoleonic tendencies. So I am thrilled to be here in Waterloo. You know, we're here tonight because our country's in crisis, because we're bankrupting our kids and grandkids, because our constitutional rights are under assault each and every day, and because America has receded from leadership in the world. And it's made the world a much more dangerous place. And yet I want to share with everyone here a word of hope and encouragement and exhortation, something incredible is sweeping the state of Iowa, is sweeping this country. There is an awakening and there is a spirit of revival that is sweeping this country.
as Glenn so powerfully observed, the stakes have never been higher than they are right now. And we're nine days out, nine days out from the Iowa caucuses. The times of the political attack ads, the times of the radio ads and TV ads and mailers and all the garbage and back and forth, all of that is past. And this is now the time for the men and women in this room, for the men and women of Iowa, to make a choice. To make a choice, and I'll tell you, each and every one of you, millions of Americans are counting on to vet the candidates, to make this choice right, because when you go and stand up and caucus, you're not just caucusing for yourself or your family, you are caucusing for people all across the country that do not have the opportunity to do what each and every one of you is privileged to do. You have the ability to change the direction of this nation. Now let me ask, has anyone else here been burned by a politician? Have you all noticed that there's some politicians over and over again that sound great on the campaign trail? They say all sorts of things that sound terrific, and then they go to Washington and they don't do what they said. You know, we were told if in 2010, if only we had a Republican House, things would be different. How did that work out? Then we were told the problem is Harry Reid in 2014, if only we had a Republican Senate. How did that work out? Over and over again, we've seen politicians who say one thing and do another. So how do we make this choice in this election? Because I'll tell you, we cannot get burned again. The stakes are too high. I'm going to suggest a way for each of you to assess all of the candidates, which is don't listen to anything we say. Don't listen to what I say. Don't listen to what any other candidate says. Ignore our campaign speeches. Scripture gives us a different test to measure a candidate, which is you shall know them by their fruit. Rather than listening to the promises can candidates make, ask of each and every candidate, show me. Show me where you've stood and walked. Show me where you fought for our principles. I'm going to suggest to you seven major battles we've seen play out in recent years, each of which has been, as Ronald Reagan would put it, a time for choosing. And I'm going to suggest that looking to those seven battles, to those seven core principles, is how the men and women of Iowa should make this decision. Let's start with life. Life is foundational. Without the right to life, there is no liberty. There is no pursuit of happiness. Every other right depends on the precious, precious right to life. Now, every candidate in a Republican primary will say they're pro-life. Have you noticed that, by the way? It's one of the great victories. Have you noticed how many millions of dollars establishment candidates are, are spending trying to convince us that they're really one of us? You know, on that debate stage, you don't see a single candidate standing up there saying, I'm a squishy establishment moderate. I stand for nothing. <laughs> Nobody says that. So they all say they're pro-life. Fine. Here's the question we should ask. Show me. When have you stood and fought to defend the right to life? Before I was in the U.S. Senate, I was the Solicitor General of Texas, the chief lawyer for the state in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. In that role, we led a coalition of states before the U.S. Supreme Court defending the federal ban on partial birth abortions, and we won 5-4.
We led another coalition of states defending New Hampshire's parental notification law, and we won unanimously. And when the state of Texas passed a law banning the taxpayer funding for Planned Parenthood, a local district court struck that law down. I had the honor of personally arguing the appeal in the Court of Appeals, and we won unanimously defunding Planned Parenthood. You know, many of us remember the second Republican debate in the Reagan Library, where just about every candidate looked in the TV cameras and emotionally talked about the need to stop Planned Parenthood. Well, just a few weeks later was a knockdown, drag out battle on Capitol Hill over taxpayer funding for Planned Parenthood. Millions of Americans rose up and said, Enough is enough. Stop this. I was proud to stand with millions of Americans, which pastors across this country, saying, Stop the funding. And the question to ask of the other very fine individuals standing on that debate stage, where were they? When the battle was being fought, where were they? A second principle, a second core principle is marriage and religious liberty. You know, we were heartbroken last June when five unelected judges on the U.S. Supreme Court arrogantly purported to tear down the marriage laws of all 50 states. That decision was fundamentally illegitimate. It was wrong. It was not the Constitution of the United States. It was judicial activism. Courts do not make law, and that was lawless. That decision, likewise, was a time for choosing. Several of the leading candidates, Republican candidates for president, when the Supreme Court's gay marriage decision came out, several came out and said, this is now the settled law of the land. We must accept it, surrender, and move on. Let me tell you, those are word for word the talking points of Barack Obama. And I'll tell you this, listen, as voters, any Republican candidate who says we must surrender, accept it, and move on, we know to an absolute certainty if they ever became president, they would not defend the institution of marriage. You know, we understand that the best environment for a child to be raised is a loving two-parent home with a mother and father caring for that child. I'll note the institution of marriage was not created by the Congress of the United States. It was not created by the Supreme Court. It precedes the United States of America. It precedes the Supreme Court for millennia God ordained marriage as the union of one man and one woman. And hand in hand with marriage is religious liberty because of the wake of this lawless, illegitimate marriage decision that will not stand has been an assault on religious liberty. For seven years from Washington, an assault on religious liberty. I'll tell you, for me, religious liberty has been a passion for two decades fighting to defend our religious liberty. I was proud to defend the Ten Commandments monument on the state capitol grounds in Texas, go to the U.S. Supreme Court, and win 
when a federal court of appeal struck down the Pledge of Allegiance because it includes the words one nation under God, I was honored to bring together all 50 states to go to the U.S. Supreme Court to defend the pledge and to win unanimously. And when the ACLU sued in California seeking to tear down the Mojave Desert Veterans Memorial, a lone white Latin cross erected 70 years ago to honor the men and women who gave their lives in World War I, I was incredibly humbled and honored to represent over three million veterans defending that Veterans Memorial. We went to the U.S. Supreme Court and we won 5-4. We're a nation that was founded by men and women fleeing religious oppression, coming to this land, seeking a land where we could seek out and worship the Lord God Almighty with all of our hearts, minds, and souls without the government getting in the way. Just a few months ago, we hosted a religious liberty rally here in Iowa. As you know, the media regularly ridicules and suggests these threats don't exist. What we did is we brought together nine heroes, people who came and stood and told their stories, ordinary people, a florist, a baker, a soldier, a fireman who simply stood up for their faith and they were persecuted. They, they were fired. They lost their job. They paid thousands in fines. They faced death threats. And I'll tell you, you hear their stories, and it's uplifting. It is powerful. Religious liberty is under assault right now. Now, I'll tell you, I have pledged, if I'm elected president on the first day in office, I will direct every agency of the federal government, the Department of Justice, the IRS, and every other agency, that the persecution of religious liberty ends today. And also on that first day in office, I will instruct the U.S. Department of Justice to open an investigation into Planned Parenthood and prosecute any and all criminal violations. If life matters to you, if marriage matters to you, if religious liberty matters to you, then don't listen to the promises of politicians. Look to their records. Because if a politician has never stood and fought for the right to life, has never stood and fought for marriage, has never stood and fought for religious liberty, if a politician has lived 60 years of his life supporting partial birth abortion, then we should not be surprised if, as president, they would not defend life or marriage or religious liberty either. And as Glenn powerfully observed, the next president is going to nominate one, two, three, maybe four Supreme Court justices. Anyone who has never stood for life, never stood for marriage, never stood for religious liberty, I ask you a very simple question. What kind of Supreme Court justices do you suppose they will appoint? I give you my solemn word that every justice I appoint to the Supreme Court will be a principled constitutionalist who will be faithful to the law and will not impose his or her preferences from the bench.
a third time for choosing the battle over guns. The spring of 2013, we were all horrified at the tragic shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. When a sick, deranged indi individual went into a school and murdered little children, Heidi and I are the parents of two little girls, that anyone would, would harm kids is an unspeakable evil. And you know, President Obama had the opportunity then to really bring us together. President Obama could have brought Republicans and Democrats together and said, let's go after violent criminals. Let's come after, let's target violent criminals. Let's come down on them like a ton of bricks. But instead, sadly, the president followed the path that he follows over and over again. What his former chief of staff used to say, you never want to let a good crisis go to waste. So instead, he proposed not going after the criminals, but trying to undermine the constitutional right to keep and bear arms. Now, let me tell you, the Second Amendment, It's not about hunting. The Second Amendment, it's not about skeet shooting or target shooting. Those are wonderful, they're a lot of fun to do, but that's not why the Second Amendment is in the Bill of Rights. The Second Amendment is in the Bill of Rights because it is a fundamental natural right of each and every one of us that if anyone comes into our home, seeks to harm our family, seeks to harm our children, that we can keep and bear arms and defend our families. Well, Barack Obama in the spring of 2013 did the same thing he did after San Bernardino. He immediately began coming after the Second Amendment instead. Millions of us rose up to stop it. I was proud to stand with millions of Americans against that assault on the Second Amendment as we rose up, as we lit up the phones. Every single proposal of Barack Obama's to undermine the Second Amendment was voted down on the floor of the Senate. Now, in a Republican presidential primary, every candidate is going to say, I support the Second Amendment. A simple question I would suggest each of us ask, great. When it was under assault from Barack Obama, when it was at risk of being taken away from by the federal government, where were you? Did you stand and fight, or were you nowhere to be found? A fourth time for choosing, Obamacare. Take Obamacare. Please take Obamacare. <laughs> In the summer and fall of 2013, millions of Americans rose up all across this country against the disaster, against the train wreck that is Obamacare. Millions of Americans lit up the phone and said, stop us from this disaster that is taking our jobs, that is forcing people into part-time work, that is taking our doctors and insurance and driving our premiums through the roof. Millions of us stood up. I was proud to stand alongside each and every one of you and say, enough is enough is enough. Now, in this Republican primary, every Republican candidate says they oppose Obamacare. Although I would note at least one of the candidates, a candidate that Glenn had a lot to say about, <laughs> at least one of the candidates supports Bernie Sanders-style full socialized medicine. Now, let me be clear. Listen, in the past couple of weeks, Mr. Trump has decided to unleash a load of invective and insults at me. That's his prerogative. I have no intention of responding in kind. <laughs> uh, 
I think the people of Iowa and the people of this country deserve more than, than politicians bickering like school children and insulting each other with schoolyard taunts. Not only will I not insult Donald Trump, I will sing his praises personally, but I do think policy is fair game. And if he is going to advocate that the government should pay for the health care of all Americans, full socialized health care, just like Bernie Sanders, then I'm obliged to point out that that is exactly the opposite of where I stand on the issue. And if I am elected president, we will repeal every word of Obamacare. A fifth time for choosing is the rampant cronyism of the Washington cartel. You know, last year I wrote a book called A Time for Truth. It describes what I call the Washington cartel, the career politicians in both parties that get in bed with the lobbyists and special interests and grow and grow and grow government. I've said for a long time, the biggest divide in this country, it's not politically between Republicans and Democrats, it's between career politicians in Washington and the American people. Amen. Every Republican candidate for president stands up and says, I will stand up to Washington. Well, that's great. The natural follow-up is, when have you ever stood up to Washington? Who has taken on not just Democrats, but leaders in their own party? I tell you this, any Republican candidate who has stood up and supported Barack Obama's TARP, big bank bailout of Wall Street, any Republican candidate who has stood up and supported Barack Obama's stimulus plan and said it needs to be bigger and bigger and bigger, you can rest for sure they will not be willing to stand up to Washington and the corporate welfare and cronyism that is bankrupting our kids and grandkids. One principle that is very, very clear, no one in history has ever grown a backbone after moving into 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. A sixth time for choosing was the battle over amnesty. In 2013, we had an epic drag down battle over amnesty. Barack Obama and Chuck Schumer and Harry Reid pushed a massive amnesty plan aided and abetted by far too many establishment Republicans in Washington. And the Rubio-Schumer bill almost became law. It passed the Senate of the United States with a substantial majority, all of the Democrats and a whole bunch of Republicans supported the Rubio-Schumer amnesty bill. And then it headed over to the House. And House leadership, John Boehner, intended and said he intended to take it up and pass it with the votes of the Democrats. It would have been Republican leadership and all the Democrats teaming up against all the Republicans in the House of Representatives. Now. There are a lot of candidates in this race who talk about immigration, who say they care deeply about stopping illegal immigration, about stopping amnesty. Well, as I suggested, don't listen to what any of us say. Look to what we do. That was a moment where we were inches away from losing. If House leadership had taken it up and passed it with the Democrats, it would have gone 
to Barack Obama's desk, and Barack Obama would have signed the Rubio Schumer amnesty into law. 12 million people here illegally would have immediately been granted amnesty. We were on the verge of losing it. That was a time for choosing. Some chose to stand with Chuck Schumer and Harry Reid and Barack Obama. I'll tell you, I was proud to stand alongside Senator Jeff Sessions and Iowa's own Steve King and fight to stop amnesty and to secure the borders. That was a moment, a time for choosing. And let me make clear, Jeff Sessions didn't win that fight, Steve King didn't win that fight, I didn't win that fight. You won that fight. We provided a voice and helped provide a catalyst to millions of Americans rising up and saying, no, we want instead to respect the rule of law. We want instead to secure our borders. We want instead to maintain American jobs. We want instead to keep this country safe. Now, any candidate today who tells you they care about illegal immigration and amnesty. If they did not stand up and lead with the American people stopping Rubio Schumer in 2013, then their actions have conveyed more than a thousand speeches can ever convey. If I am elected president, we will secure the border and we will end illegal immigration. We're going to build a wall, and I've got somebody in mind to build it. And the seventh and final time for choosing, the battle over Iran and stopping radical Islamic terrorism. <laughs> Let me say, any presidential candidate who believes we should maintain the Iranian nuclear deal leave it in place, see what happens, or maybe go and try to renegotiate it, does not understand the nature of the Ayatollah Khamenei. If I am elected president on the first day in office, I will rip to shreds this catastrophic Iranian nuclear deal. The most important determination everyone here has to make in this election is who is best prepared to be Commander-in-Chief? Who is best prepared to keep this country safe? Who has the knowledge? Who has the experience? Who has the judgment? Who has the clarity of vision? Who has the strength of resolve to hunt down and kill our enemies and protect the safety and security of the women and men of this country? And that determination is made not based on campaign speeches, but who has been standing and leading and fighting to stop this Iranian deal, to stop ISIS, to stop radical Islamic terrorism, to call it out by its name. Islamism is evil. And any jihadist that declares war against the United States that joins ISIS, we will utterly and completely destroy ISIS.
Seven fundamental battles, seven times for choosing. How do we avoid being burned? We demand of the next candidate not that they say what we want to hear. It's too easy to tell us what we want to hear. But we demand instead that they have walked the walk, that they have a proven record. You know, I have an old boss who used to say, if I'm ever accused of being a Christian, I'd like for there to be enough evidence to convict me. The same is very much true. If we want the next president to be a principled constitutionalist, a conservative, someone who defends life and marriage and religious liberty and the Judeo-Christian values that built this country, then we need to demand that whoever that candidate is, that he or she have walked the walk and have demonstrated they will stand with the people over Washington. You know, many of you have gotten to know my father, Pastor Rafael Cruz. As a teenager, he was imprisoned and tortured in Cuba. And he said to me many, many times, I've seen my freedom taken away once before, and I'll die before I let it happen again. If you agree with me, if you agree with David Barton and Bob Vanderplotz and Steve King and Glenn Beck, that the stakes have never been higher, that it is now or never that we are at the edge of a precipice steer it staring down, and if we continue going another four or eight more years in this current direction, we risk losing the greatest country in the history of the world. If you agree with me, then I want to ask each and every one of you to do two things. Number one, join us. Join us right now. Come together and commit. Nine days from now, I will stand and caucus and speak out, and we will speak and stand united. In these next nine days, the Iowa caucus will be decided. As the Iowa caucus goes, the Republican nomination could well go, and the fate of the country could well go. And so I want to ask each of you not only that a week from Monday you show up and stand and speak out, but that you reach out to your friends and family and neighbors and everyone else and say, come join us as well. I want to ask everyone here to vote for me nine times. <laughs> now look, we're not Democrats. I'm not suggesting voter fraud. But if every one of you finds eight other people to show up and caucus a week from Monday, you will have voted nine times. That's how we win. Listen, every four years, the state of Iowa is beset by a pestilence of politicians <laughs> that descend upon you. Your TV airwaves have attack after attack after attack. Your radio airwaves have one after the other after the other. The mailers that pile up, the good news on the mailers, they make really good kindling in your fireplace. But the time for all of that is past. This caucus will be won, friend to friend, 
neighbor to neighbor, pastor to pastor, each of you has the ability to stand and fight. We have nine days between now and the caucus. If you find one person each day to come and caucus, we will win the Iowa caucus. And then the second thing I want to ask each of you to do is to pray, is to lift this country up in prayer, to commit today, each and every day between now and election day, to lift this country up in prayer, to spend even just one minute a day saying, Father God, please continue this awakening, continue this spirit of revival, awaken the body of Christ to pull us back from the abyss. We are standing on the promises of 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear their prayers and forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Let me tell you a bit of history that our friends in the mainstream media will never share with you. In January 1981, when Ronald Reagan took the oath of office, his left hand was resting on 2 Chronicles 7.14, a very real and concrete manifestation of the promise from the Word of God. This nation has faced challenges like this before. We have been at the abyss before, and the American people, it's not about me or anybody else. It's not about a politician. It is about all of us. We, the people, together, we have stood before and pulled back from the abyss. We have done it before, and we can do it again to save this nation that we love with all of our hearts. Come to caucus, come to caucus, come to caucus. For Ted Cruz, bring nine other people and work it every day between now and a week from Monday. Thanks so much for being here. God bless everybody. Let's get this done and send this Iowa message to the rest of the country.